Hello, beautiful community. It's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 78, and I am joined by one of my favorite YouTubers, Vlad Vexler, a professional philosopher. Uh, political philosophy is your uh, specialty, is that right, Vlad? Yep. And you're a public intellectual about town, right? A baby public intellectual. <laughs> well, it's better than uh, you know a wannabe public intellectual, which is what I am. Uh, but uh, you are of Ukrainian uh, background originally, right? Uh, Ukraine, ethnically Ukrainian, raised in Russia, no? I'm probably more ethnically Ukrainian than Russian, but I'm originally from Moscow, from the Soviet Union. So if I'm either, I'm Russian. Got it. Okay. And then uh, educated and in the West, and you've been in the West for how long now? Since the 80s. Okay. So... That means that uh, I lived in the Soviet Union, but I actually never lived in Russia. Wow, that's incredible. And are you in the UK presently? I have been for 30 years on and off on this island. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stranded. Luckily, they have a lot of stuff there. Much hinterland uh, to gather supplies from. But anyway, uh, so Vlad is known uh, as for commenting on the situation in Ukraine, what he goes out of his way to describe as Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, uh, just to try to get the facts straight out the gate. Uh, and I certainly appreciate that. I would like to ask you, Vlad, I'm a sort of garden variety American center left person. Um, generally supportive of U.S. support of Ukraine. When I get into a fight, an argument on the internet with a, an American conservative, and we're arguing about the extent to which Russia was justified in its invasion, when we're arguing about whether the, the rights of ethnic Russians were being respected in Eastern Ukraine prior to the invasion or what have you, what do you reckon we're actually arguing about? Because I don't think we're arguing about Ukraine or Russia or anything. I just don't think we care that much. I mean, we, we probably should care a lot more than we do, but I don't think we care that much. It's like become a proxy for something, but I don't know what it's a proxy for. Do you? I think there are lots of proxies, but you're right. Normally, these conversations are narcissistic, and they're not just narcissistic in the United States. They're narcissistic all over the West. By narcissistic, I don't mean the people involved in them are narcissists. I just mean it's a kind of cultural narcissism whereby we project our own challenges, our own battles with polarization onto foreign policy issues. I think one of the very biggest problems today is that a lot of people are either losing trust in institutions or feeling like that they, they don't make sense anymore. Institutions don't make sense anymore, you mean? Yeah, that people look out onto politics and what they see is kind of opaque, which is scary. And people feel scared and people feel lost. And that is a worse feeling actually, than feeling betrayed or disempowered, even though these are terrible feelings to have too as a citizen. Because if, if you feel betrayed or disempowered, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to give up on the political process in your country. It doesn't, doesn't mean you want to give up on the very idea of it generating a result in the future which you might accept. But if you're feeling that it's all opaque and that it's like a sports game where three or four sports are mixed into one and you can't tell what the rules are anymore, then it's tempting to throw eggs and tomatoes at the whole thing and give up. So one of the things that's happening in a lot of these conversations is people saying, I don't trust my institutions to do anything. And I don't trust my institutions to do foreign policy. And if they're doing foreign policy quite aggressively in some part of the world, it, it must be that something fishy is going on because they are no longer adequate to their task, which is to look after me as a citizen in this damn country. So that's one thing that's going on. But of course, there are many, many, many others. But the, the pattern here is that all of these things we could list would probably be about internal conflicts in American politics that are being projected onto an issue. I don't want to say that's everybody. I think some people do genuinely have a view, huh? um, but I think the risk is that. I mean, I, I think I think the reason that I want Ukraine to win the war, um, 
totally put looking at the conflict as as a conflict within a bottle which of course it's not and you're always very careful in your talks vlad to emphasize that uh you think this is not at all what is going on here is not at all limited to what's going on in in eastern ukraine but if we to look at it in in its bottle i think the reason i want ukraine to win if i'm really honest with myself is that i see in ukraine a bunch of people who are choosing um, what what their approach to modernity is going to be, or post modernity, whatever, however you want to define it, and do they want to go with a Russian model of acting and being and relating to the world and relating to each other, or do they want to go with a Western model of those things? And being a Westerner myself, I naturally think my model is better. On the other hand, I think I have some good reasons for thinking that my model is better, and I think my model's uh, track record, the scoreboard kind of indicates that, <laughs> you know, the Western way of doing business and doing life um, seems to be beating out whatever the Russian model of doing business and doing politics and doing life is. So I see Ukraine at a crossroads, and they're, they, want to, they want to go in the direction of me, but their old daddy is saying, no, 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 you, have to, you, have, you can't move out, you have to stay with me. And I think that that's unfair. And so that's why I think I want Ukraine to win. Not knowing me, Vlad, um, but knowing a lot about me, do you, do you reckon that's probably what's going on in my head? Or do you think that there's like something else? Is my, is pure partisanship driving me here? Is it just that I'm just kind of an American lefty and the American left supports Ukraine? My team wants that team to win. So rah, rah, rah. No, I think that it's natural to be outraged when a country wants to be free and it's taken over by destruction and violence and not just destruction and violence but destruction and violence that doesn't seem to have much to offer except just the destruction and the violence so it's natural to feel outraged but i think what you're also it's in some place in your head sticking on top of that response is some idea of what's in it for the United States. I think we have to do that too in the end. Well, sure. Otherwise, we will end up with a purely foreign aid picture of the conflict. And then in your conversations and your Twitter fights or whatever we're going to find ourselves in, yeah. we're not going to have enough to say if all we have is a humanitarian or foreign aid story there. So I do think you think everything you think, but I also think you have some, some further thoughts about US foreign policy that you might like or not like. And I think this is hard because what is tricky about this is that um, a lot of people seem to have taken a hawkish position on the Ukraine war that are against a hawkish US foreign policy normally. Yeah. That can be really hard to make sense of. Is this, right here, this, this guy, look at, you're looking at him. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm a British citizen, but I protested against the Iraq war. Yeah organized even against the Iraq war. But I think that, um, so we need that story about how it's about us uh, and about our interests, not just a matter of, of foreign aid. And that story is gonna help with all of these, uh, with all of these quarrels. Because the pro-Ukraine argument, the argument that it's worth it to support Ukraine, is in the end going to primarily run through national interest and sure. only secondly run through humanitarian a humanitarian story. I mean, uh, Westerners or Americans, uh, United Statesians, we have no adjectival form. We have no demonym. It's terrible. Um, uh, United Statesians who are opposed to uh, U.S. aid to Ukraine, certainly something that's on their mind is just, uh, just uh, the allocation of resources. They want those monies at home. But that can't be entirely what's going on. Your typical e Elon Musk, uh, Elon Muscovite, if you will, in the United States, uh, is is opposed, is rooting for Russia, or at least rooting f for not total Ukrainian victory for some other reason that strikes me as cultural rather than anything else. And I'm not totally sure I can put my finger on it. I see several things with Musk, but I see two 
The second one in importance is his perception of avoiding nuclear war. And that's an important factor. And in fact, that's the central consideration of your government in this conflict. As it should be, should it not, It's right? not being talked about in public, but actually much of what's going on behind the scenes would, will be the avoidance of escalation and especially nuclear escalation. But above that, for Musk, there is an anti-institutional anti argument. Musk is an anti-institutionalist who thinks that, in a certain sense, the establishment has failed and basic political institutions can't be trusted anymore. Just what we said a few minutes earlier. Yeah. And I think that's driving him. The idea that these institutions simply cannot deliver even a, a morally adequate position on an issue like this because they are too corrupt or too blinded or too self-serving or too detached from the interests of ordinary American voters. So I think that we're back to not just trust, breakdown of trust in institutions, but the exploitation of the breakdown of trust in institutions, which is, of course, a field day for anybody who is in the business of political entrepreneurship. I mean, this is uh, you know, an extraordinary historic level crisis of trust in institutions. It's something marvelous to explore, to exploit for people who want to engage in entrepreneurial political activity. Musk is not very well informed about what's going on there. He knows quite a few facts, he has some contacts, but um, he doesn't have a profound knowledge of the situation. So again, it's driven by domestic political concerns. Well, there's something about the way Musk and his followers behave generally, but also in this particular area, that is to me really similar to how I see um, the, the Putin regime behaving, where um, they're, they're not, they're kind of just throwing rocks. Um, you know, Russia can't win this conflict. It's, there's, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing here that ends well for them. Um, what they're doing is just trying to, you know, they're, they're, it's like they're being held down to the ground and they know that they're not going to be able to resist arrest, but they can maybe punch the cop a few times in the face before they end up going downtown, right? There's something that is kind of um, reminiscent of, boy, this is extraordinarily loaded, but I mean, purely in terms of tactics, kind of reminiscent of terrorism or any kind of um, highly asymmetrical warfare where um, somebody who kind of probably can't win for whatever reason or another, just wants to try to, all they can do is they can make the other side hurt. And if they can make the other side hurt, then that's an end unto itself. Is, do, am I sizing up at least uh, the Putin instinct or the, the instinct of the, what you would call the, the Z or the Z radicals who are the, the, the more hawkish, uh, yeah. 10 to 20 percent of Russians who you reckon are actually kind of pushing Putin more so than the other way around. I think that you're close. So we're talking about a baby that wants to smash the toys because others won't play with the baby and won't play with the same toys. But there's also the hope that the others can be chased off from the playground eventually. So I think they hope that there is a, a way for them to win. And I actually think there is, but it's just as a, a a distant long shot. Well, I, let me, let me, can I qualify that really quickly? I, absolutely. I mean, I can see a number of ways for, for Russia to win the present situation, but as, as a, as a society, they're in a state of terminal decline. I think as a society and an economy, no, no, nothing that happens here will save the, save them from their permanent civilizational decline. I think that that's basically right. The civilizational project is too empty to go anywhere. It doesn't have anything to offer even Russians. But it could hold on for 10, 15 years. Sure. And what they think, and this is where Musk is not so well initiated into the dynamics in Russia, but what they think is that if enough democratic decline occurs in the West... They could challenge NATO again in five or six years when they're a little bit more stable and we're a lot weaker. And they don't even have to take all of Ukraine. They could just create a provocation in Eastern Estonia, dilute Article 5, the idea that if one NATO state is attacked, that others should come to its military aid. And that way, dilute this Central Western Alliance and reconstitute the international order insofar as it ever was an order at all. So that's their plan. And I think that 
the Maskian story about how to deal with this conflict is more connected with the idea, which is a misrepresentation of this war, that Russia has some national interest in Ukraine and it wants to swallow up a bit of Ukraine. And the reason that the West reaction has been so strong is that that's understood by enough people not to be the plan. In fact, it's largely not a war about Ukraine for Russia. It's a war about that ultimatum that Russia put on the table before the war, in which they more or less stated that all of Eastern Europe should be um, not quite theirs, and yeah. should be a space um, which should be recognized as having only countries with toy sovereignties, and over these toy sovereignties, the Kremlin should have some uh, proprietorial control. Right. And so, once you put that on the table and you exit out of Russia needs to own uh, a bit of Ukrainian territory or half of Ukrainian territory, whatever, once you come out of that kind of thinking, you see a, a, a wider pattern of escalation that you can't stop by brokering a deal in Ukraine. And that is your core argument as to why the United States needs to remain in the fight and the West needs to remain in the fight, that this is bigger than Ukraine. This is part of a broader uh, revanchist Russian project to take back its territory one way or another. And what I want to ask you about that is um, you know, another another popular uh, guy on YouTube talking about such stuff is the uh, geopolitical strategist Peter Zion and his point of view, his argument that he makes repeatedly is that Russia's goals, whether it's aware of it or not, are chiefly geopolitical and territorial in nature, that they're trying to secure territory that they can affect, that has topography that they can effectively seal off in order to seal off the territory from invasion. And then the picture that I get from your content, Vlad, is that um, it's more about Russian prestige. Um, it's more emotional. And that scares the living crap out of me because fights for prestige, for prestige is so fungible, right? That like anybody can, go if I, if I say, if I say that my goal is to conquer my neighbor's house, that's a, that's a very, um, tangible goal, right? I, I can either do it or not. And I can look over at that high fence in the security system. And I can think, you know what? There's probably no way I'm going to be able to take that house. And if I do, the cops are just going to come and they're going to kick me back out to my house, right? So therefore, this is a fight that I can't win. I shouldn't really do it. So I'm not going to do it. But if I'm over there trying to get respect from my neighbor, you can place the goalpost wherever you want, man. And therefore, I can see a path to victory in going over to break into my neighbor's house. Because all I want is respect. And whatever, if something happens that makes me feel as though I have mm -hmm. regained my prestige in the neighborhood, then I can declare victory or I can keep fighting until I've got whatever, where I keep fighting until I reach wherever I choose to place that goalpost. That scares the crap out of me. Do you think that's more what's going on, Vlad? I think it's it's closer, yes. So I think there are two stories there to why this war is happening. Partly it's a regime security war, because by prosecuting this war, Putin can consolidate his power at home via various mechanisms that might be too boring to discuss. Well, uh, let's, I mean, very quickly, it would be like appeasing hardliners, which is something every every we all know about in our own domestic politics. Appeasing hardliners and... Um, uh, trying to uh, deal with internal division and and uh, within the, the highest ranks of government. Right? Sidestepping via this war, uh, dissolution of his perceived legitimacy among the younger generations ah. in particular. Oh, yeah. So he felt that without foreign escalation, he couldn't sustain power stably at home for the next five to ten years. Yeah. And that's where most of the... Russia experts go when they start explaining this. But then over and above this sits this connected story of an escalation against the West that is about appealing to the West to reconsider how it sees Russia's role in the world and to make a series of the kind of fundamental concessions that the West can't really make. And that is driven by not just emotional, but also, I would say, mystical thinking. And that's particularly worrying, and it seems to me a lot of that got consolidated in Putin's mind during his intense discussions that he had with a couple of people very close to him over the period of the pandemic isolation, when he was largely alone with one or two people yeah. with whom he talked about this, who also have terribly radical views. And I think that 
the difference between what I recommend and what Peter recommends is, first of all, unimportant because you can't argue with somebody who speaks against the background of such beautiful nature. So if anybody watches Peter Zion's videos, um, is our colleague now on YouTube who speaks in the most fantastic natural um, locations. As, as you say, he's a, force of, he's a force of nature reporting from nature. He's reporting from nature, but where he's absolutely right is this is a wider pattern of escalation. Mm. This is where I share with him. Where I depart is that I don't think this is about plugging uh, gaps, um, plugging geopolitical security uh, worries, um, or indeed timing the war in such a way as to um, uh, be sensitive and highly motivated by a demographic crisis in Russia, which is real, yeah. but Peter thinks that's the central motivation for the war, that they're not going to be demographically able to prosecute wars like that in the future, start doing it now. That seems to me to be not in the minds of the people who've organized all of this. They seem in denial about their demographic decline. So this is a regime security war and a mysticism-driven foreign escalation war. Yeah. Well... All a very sensitive uh, situation. And if you, dear listener, have any kind of sensitive security situation of your own, consider connecting to the internet with NordVPN, sponsor of this episode. Get it now at nordvpn.com slash Ragusea. I am flying to New York City next week for a thing. And when I'm sitting in the terminal, maybe editing this episode and logged into the public airport Wi-Fi, where someone else on the same public network could definitely snoop on me, well, you can bet I'm going to connect through a virtual private network with Nord. You just pull up the app on any of your devices, hit connect, and your traffic is routed through one of their secure servers. Nord uses double encryption, where the second VPN server is unaware of the original IP address and connections are made via both UDP and TCP protocols. With NordVPN, you get all of the advantages of the Onion route like Tor, plus the added security of a VPN tunnel. Nord can help you obscure your physical location if you're in or if you're traveling to any country where internet censorship or surveillance is a particular concern. NordVPN can definitely help you out. You can virtually visit any of the many countries where Nord has servers. For useful, important stuff, yes, if you need to virtually visit them, but also useful for fun stuff like streaming your favorite shows. Lots of internet content is uh, geofenced so that you can only watch it in certain countries. Just connect through a different country with Nord. Get an exclusive NordVPN deal with my link in the description, which is nordvpn.com slash Ragusea. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, nordvpn.com slash Ragusea, and that is in the description. Thank you, NordVPN. We are talking with Vlad Vexler, one of my favorite uh, YouTubers, and I suppose the extent to which I would never call myself a public intellectual because I don't think I'm smart enough, but like I definitely am borrowing a lot of um, tools from the public intellectuals toolbox, and that is to a great extent your toolbox, Vlad. So I was wondering if we could sort of talk about some of that stuff, um, how, we, how we go about being guys on YouTube who have gathered followings to us of a bunch of people who want to know what we think about almost everything. And for me, that's the most difficult thing because I have some things I know a lot about, a bunch of things I know a little about, and then a lot of things that I know absolutely nothing about. And you are so much better, Vlad, at really any other public intellectual I've ever seen on YouTube um, at drawing a line and saying, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that. I'm not your expert. I actually know a lot about that and I could talk about it and make it say stuff that sounds smart and passable and was good enough. But before, but for the good of the public pool of wisdom, I am going to refrain from answering your question about X, dear, dear viewer. Um, wow, Vlad. Well, I guess it's not a question. I just wanted to applaud you. You're really good at that. And thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. <laughs> It's lovely of you. I guess I should have a question at the end of that, but if you would just like to say something in response, yeah, the, go the, ahead. The, the question for us in this is about responsibility and about putting the audience first, but not putting them first in the sense of pandering to what they most immediately want, hmm. 
but putting them first in the sense of offering something that's going to be digestive for them, but in the best sense of that word, not easily absorbed, but something that you can put into someone's body and the next day they're going to feel morally and physically better for having it inside them. And that's very important. And that's much more important to me than informing people, actually. Huh. Um, so even in the minutes we've just been talking, there's a small part of me that's, that was infinitesimally uncomfortable with our conversation in a healthy way. And here is why. Because, of course, we were representing the views of let us say, half of the population of your society or of my society. Yeah. And, and um, one of the things that I emphasize so much is how scary it is for citizens to feel that they can't engage in conflict effectively. And the solution to not being able to engage in conflict effectively for a lot of citizens is to engage in it even less effectively. Um, and so one of the things I think is very important is that Everybody is included in your audience, but also if it's a conversation that's remotely political, they have to have a sense that everybody in their society is also kind of included. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that might come from a place of respect and love, but sometimes it might come from a place of wanting to throw up, but engaging nevertheless, smiling nevertheless out of a recognition that we would love to live in a world in which we can choose who shares the table of politics with us. But that can't really be done unless we secede <laughs> or, or, or emigrate. Um, but you know, we're stuck with our fellow citizens and they're stuck with us. Indeed. Um, this is something I wish I could tell folks on the American left and it's something I think to myself, having grown up in the Northeast and then lived most of my professional life now in the South, you know, I, people up there, the way they talk about half of their fellow citizens, it's like, what, what is your, what are you, what are you proposing? Are you proposing to kill them all? Are you, are you just proposing to like genocide, like half the country? Because if, if not, then the way you're talking ha is is completely unproductive, and, and it may be true. You may it may be your truth, but anyone who thinks that just that because something is true, that's a good reason to say it, has never been in a successful long term relationship. There's all kinds of things that are true, or that you feel are true, personal truths that do not need to be voiced at all times because nothing good comes of it. I just wish I could shake a lot of a lot of people I used to live near. And tell them that. And, you know, this is not a moral principle in the first instance. It's, it's a principle about being an effective citizen. Well, it's a moral principle against genociding, you know, the half your well, civilization that you that's don't agree true, with. For sure. I'm morally opposed to that. So in but the absence of that option, what are we going to do instead? Well, now we have to have pragmatic positions like mm. be polite, shut up, listen. Even when you think the other person is categorically wrong, shut up and listen some more. And of course, the, the, you know, the effectiveness point here comes in when you realize that um, fostering certain kinds of polarization is not in every case, but in most cases going to uh, fail to get you closer to the outcome you yourself want. So uh, an idea of a public good that we're appealing to or a sense of solidarity we all share that we're appealing to. It's not just a moral principle, it's actually an effective way of getting outcomes that you want. And I am not, because I live with a health challenge and only work a limited number of hours a day, I'm not attached to university, but one of my biggest worries about universities over the last 10 years is that they're not doing as good a job as they used to at particularly the undergraduate level, at bringing out people into the world who are able to engage with people who viscerally disagree with them in a constructive way, a way that gets them results and a way that persuades. Even if you don't persuade your um, opponent in the argument, you could persuade some people who are on the sidelines and um, watching what's going on. And so this business of being good at conflicting, right? And that means recognizing that um, your opponents aren't enemies, 
um, that a relation of political opposition is kind of a relation of cooperation on some level too. Um, that is very, very important. Where it gets hard is if your political opponents are themselves refusing to see you as opponents and are only seeing you as enemies. What do you do then? That is a, a hard question and it requires to sort of take time and explore because people are facing it in their societies too. Well, it seems to me a big driver of the polarization that we're talking about, uh, which is of course not at all limited to the United States, um, is, uh, is uh, information ecosystem siloing. Um, before we used to have fights about values, now we have fights about, fights about facts. Um, and that strikes me as really scary and, and unproductive. Fights, fights about values, what should we do in light of the given facts? That, I can't, that's what politics is. I can't think of a better, better use of, of political venues. Um, but fighting about just the basic facts of what is happening, it's terrifying. And, and, it, and whenever I think too much about whether or not I actually know the things I think I know, I think I mm -hmm. go into an epistemological crisis and mm -hmm. I figure, oh, I'll just watch a v Vlad Vexler video in my left ear while I go to sleep. <laughs> but, but this is, I mean, the reason why I bring this up is because I think... Um, I think that you are helping that problem in your own little way by not polluting the comment, the pool of believed facts, which with things that really are not fit, fit to print. Um, and I admire that about you so much and I've tried to do it myself. But on the other hand, I recognize that when my audience asks me questions about everything, you know, every political issue, every, you know, pizza topping, they want Adam's take on everything. And I'm, I, I, I don't give it because I have my inner Vlad talking to me saying only talk about things, only voice earned opinions. Right. Um, but on the other hand, I know why they do that because it's what I want. When I have a, 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 a person, a public intellectual who I've spent some time with i want to know what they think about everything and i think i i recently figured out the reason why i think it's because it's um it's because that public intellectual becomes like a a benchmark or like a a, a barometer or just some some kind of fixed position against which you can judge other distances right if i know that peter zion is generally you know uh, pro this issue, I, and some other controversial political issue comes up, I want to know what he thinks about that one because mm. I will be able to assess all of the positions on that issue better because I'll know where that one, whatever he says, I'll know where it is in relation to this other position that he has. And since I have this history with him, we have this, I have this trail of positions that Peter has, I can, it gives me something to compare to. And that strikes me as like a really legitimate uh, desire, legitimate impulse, uh, uh, and I and it makes me want to answer every single question my audience has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm done mm -hmm. talking now. If you would like to say something smarter, yeah, I think there's a big difference um, how you say what you say, right, and what you think you are doing when you say it. So there is one part of it um, where let's say, a, an academic with a speciality is talking about their speciality. There's another thing where, where a well-informed cultural commentator is talking about the same thing. There's a difference. There isn't a world of difference, but there's a difference. And then there is a situation where an activist is talking about something. An activist who may be a not just an activist for a good cause, but a constructive activist for a good cause. But nevertheless, what they want is for us to get closer right, right, to right. where they want us to land. Right. When I talk about, when I give my take on something, I'm trying to explain, I'm trying to kind of give give people an introduction into this issue and show them the various sort of angles at it, of it that I'm familiar with so that they can understand it for themselves and come to their own conclusion. Whereas an activist is explicitly speaking with the intent of persuading toward some kind of particular goal. 
Right. The paradigm of activism is that change comes before truth, even if truth matters a lot. Yeah. The paradigm that's pretty of dismal. The, the non-activist. God, is do you believe that? that? Is that that seem if that's true, that's a fatal flaw of activism, right? Like activism is inherently t- tainted if that's true. I believe that activism is impeccable in principle. Um, if your um, outcome is good and it, what you're doing gets us closer to it and you get us there without irresponsible lies, that's fine. But th- th- there is a difference here sure. um, that you can never bridge between expertise and activism because expertise is always prepared to take a step in a direction that gets you further away from a good outcome potentially and one of the biggest things that's just in my private conversations with ukraine russia experts is that they've they've struggled with this because they support ukraine in their heart but not everything they think aligns with where their heart wants to go and so a lot of folks have felt that kind of challenge, but it's it's a it's a perennial challenge for us. But I don't think I I I don't think I want you to with both feet land on that conclusion that activism is inherently suspicious because change and truth conflict within it, even if it's done well. I think that conflict can be managed responsibly or irresponsibly, you know? And I'm not saying activists can't be truthful, but I'm saying that transformation is something that that, uh, would typically take a special kind of priority. It's just not going to get with an expert. What I I like to do with the kind of dilemma you are putting on the table, Mm -hmm. you know, what what do I say? What do I, what do I not say? How far do I go giving my 743 opinions on everything in the universe? Which, of course, it should be said, you have every, you and I both have every economic incentive to do. And we have an unbelievable economic incentive to do that. And also a great incentive to not have conversations like this mm. because they don't pay <laughs> off on this platform. Um, you know, but... Granted. Um, um, and uh, that's why I've been a big, a big admirer of your long form content in, in the last few months, uh, because it's actually brave on top of that. The other thing, uh, dear listeners, is I think Adam is a beautiful writer. Um, and so it's, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's marvelous to, to listen to him for 45 minutes. It's only because I'm um, not a very good talker. Like, you're so good. You're so, like, like I, you're so quick, man. And I'm just not quick. That's why I have to write. Yeah, two things I, I, I two two things I listened to I think recently I particularly enjoyed the Ramsey one and the Marco Pierre White uh, one in particular. How very British of you! <laughs> what I love to emphasize is actually not getting the facts completely right or even getting your evaluation looking decent from every perspective, but having the right approach. And for me, the right approach has two bits in it. One is sincerity. The other is accuracy. And what really matters here are these things as virtues. That means, are you trying enough to be sincere? Um, That's to say, it's not that you can try to be sincere, but are you checking yourself, checking that some microscopic inner bullshitter inside you hasn't taken up a bigger amount of space than they should? So... Sincerity matters. But the other thing that matters is accuracy. And by accuracy, I don't mean getting things right. I mean going out of your way to try to get them right. I think too many people panic too much about making a mistake. What I actually think matters is being tethered in this way to what we might call the virtue of truthfulness, which consists of trying to be sincere as best you can, trying to make sure you're not BSing. Um, hopefully, you don't need to try too hard on that. But then also, with accuracy, trying really, really hard. Being sincere, being accurate, aspirationally, I think, gives you a clean bill of health for the long term. Because we need to judge people, like you, in my opinion, mm-hmm. over a stretch of decades. 
Um, it might be that you mess up a couple of times in one particular year. You speak in a way you shouldn't about some issue. You realize you should have known more about it. That doesn't matter. What matters is, is there going to be a disproportionate presence of these kinds of uh, wobbles over a course of 30 years? And moreover, where is the trend going to be? Is the trend going to be neutral? You're going to maintain the same level of sincerity and accuracy. Is it going to go downward where, where it goes with 95% of public commentators on YouTube because they experience a degree of algorithmic and audience capture? Or is it even going to go up over time? You know, And one of the tips that you understand so well, but I think particularly less experienced creators, I think, struggle with, is that it, it helps so much to have your imagination and your thought off YouTube if you're sharing on this platform. That's to say, don't think or analyze or explore to make content. That is not a good idea at all. So, you know, if I listen to you, what I want to do is have an experience where I know you've gone off and thought about things, and then you've come on your platform and you're talking about them. But I don't want that link to be um, so direct that there's no space between the two at all. And that is why um, some professional academics actually sometimes do okay on YouTube, because the cost of BSing professionally to them off YouTube will be so great. Yeah. And in that way, sometimes, even without perfect intent, vanity can drive people toward truthfulness, strangely enough. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Well, I find that your particular brand of public intellectualism uh, is impeccable, and it really feeds me. Dear listeners, if you'd like to feed yourself, consider making a HelloFresh sponsor of this video, America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Ragusea. Use code 50Ragusea for 50% 50 off plus free shipping. It's autumn. There's a chill in the air in the evening. The kids are back at school. They're back to music lessons and sports practices and such things in the evening. So what I'm saying is I am cold, hungry, and I have no time. Well, check out the fall menu offerings at HelloFresh.com slash 50Ragusea. It's all like shepherd's pies and lasagnas and risottos and everything that you need to just cozy up the whole house. Yes, Adam Ragusea cooks from meal kits frequently because I don't want to come up with my own recipe every night of the week and because I hate junking up my refrigerator and my pantry with a bunch of leftover ingredients. Best thing about HelloFresh to me is that all the ingredients arrive at your door pre-portioned. You follow the little step-by-step -step instructions. Most of the recipes take me like half an hour max. And at the end, there's very little, if any, leftover bits and bobs that you have to figure out how to use. Everything goes into the pot and then down your grateful gullet. Whether you're looking at the vegetarian plan that I usually get or the family friendly, the quick and easy, which is like 15 minute meals, all kinds of meal plans, but they're all seasonal. And that means you're getting farm fresh produce at your door. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Ragusea and use code 50 Ragusea for 50% 50 off plus free shipping. 50% off plus my code with my code 50 Ragusea. That's at HelloFresh.com slash Ragusea. And I thank you, HelloFresh. Vlad, what should we talk about now? Should we talk about music? We're both classical music people. Um, are you... I sort of still consider myself a failed composer. Do, is that, do you, are you, is this, is this, are you like living your fallback career right now as I kind of am? No, because I am trying to bring it about that I bridge everything eventually. <laughs> so I'm, I'm talking about two things in public at the moment, which is Western citizens being terrified about the state of their democracies and the Ukraine war. And I plan to add um, two or three other little things. One of them, of course, is something that's closer to professional philosophy and beginning to do that on a microscopic channel little by little. And I'm going to add uh, music. I have a contentless channel called Vlad Wexler Music. And we're going we're gonna to have um, probably health allowing a set of um, very small... Um, chats there about particular pieces, how to begin sort of getting inside them. Um, that'll come, uh, that'll come eventually. I mean, one of the questions that I'm fascinated by, I don't know what, what your relationship is with this, but certainly in the classical music world, 
one way to tell the difference between somebody who is a musician psychologically versus somebody who just loves music very much. And I don't want to judge. There are people who love music very much who are way more musically gifted than people who are musicians. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter sure, yeah. how it goes. But um, for me, in the classical music realm, what makes one a musician, and this is really an important point, actually, is whether one engages with the pieces via recordings of them or whether one engages with the pieces, um, if you like, more directly. Um, so I'll give you an example. Imagine an amazing music producer who is in the recording studio spending 30 minutes discussing how to weigh a chord with a pianist and saying that there's just too, too little weight in the pinky at the moment mm. and something else is off balance. If they have a musical education, but they do not play regularly, that they can talk about that chord for 30 minutes, that they can talk about what they think that score is trying to get the pianist to do, for me indicates that they think like a musician. Whereas the music lover would say, well, I know 17 recordings of this piece and that's how that chord sounds there. Mm. And maybe I prefer that one over this one. So for me, um, this idea of when you have music in your head, that is not particular performances of the piece, but your own manipulation of the piece as it has never yet been performed, right? That suggests you're in trouble and you have the psychology of a musician rather than somebody who loves music. So that's one distinction I, I, I make. Over to you. What do you, what, what, what do you think about what I've said? And um, wow. what, what, does it make, what does it make you think? Well, it's, I thought I got scared when you started on that, um, when you started on that riff because I thought that you were going to say that uh, our only... Re it's that it's a, I can tell that you're a real musician if you engage the piece by looking at the score rather than rather than listening to a recording, which of course would be tremendously uh, well. I feel like the term ableist gets thrown around too much, but I think this might actually be like a you know an appropriate use for it because there's lots of people who make that argument, and as someone who's horribly dyslexic, and the main reason I had trouble in the classical music world was that I I just can't read very well. Um, that's always been a problem though quick plug all of the people on youtube um doing uh auto page turning um presentations of classical pieces where you can watch the score and it will turn in real time um as you listen wow thank you for your service thank you for doing that and those things are just a blast for me to watch but anywho um that uh, i think what i hear you saying is that um Maybe I could fancy myself a real musician, regardless of what I'm doing for a living, if the way I engage with music is through um, having the urge to interpret or create rather than just to bask in it. Um, that when I listen to pieces of music, what I'm usually doing in my head is either rewriting them, saying, I wouldn't, uh, not that, I think you probably should have done mm, that. Or I'm thinking, oh my God, this is so much better than anything I could ever think of. And how could I, what could I steal from this? How could I. How could I, how could I just get a whiff of, of a sousson of this in whatever poor gruel I'm able to prepare, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that sense, I think I do feel like I'm a musician still, even though I, I haven't written anything to completion in quite some time. But that's the way I engage with music, and therefore I feel that I am a musician and always will be. On the other hand, gosh, being out of the game and not having my self-worth, you know, or my career prospects or anything tied to it, and then um, leaving especially classical music behind for some time and now coming back to it, wow, I'm enjoying it so much more than I ever have before. I'm relaxing so much more. I'm not stressing out and kind of measuring myself against whatever it is performance or composition-wise. And it's just a delight. And I hope, have you gotten to that point in your life? Because it's delightful for me. No, it's, it's really demanding and stressful, and I have to feel quite physically well to, to engage with it. I listen with full concentration when I listen to music or when I read a score, so it's much easier for me to speak live on YouTube than to listen to a piece of music, interestingly. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a demanding physical experience, and because of my health issue, I want to pick 
the best moments to to do it and i want to build a life where i have the space for that which means you know eventually finding ways to outsource some of some of these things all these conversations that are being had on youtube yeah. um in terms of the stuff that needs to be done behind the scenes so eventually that's where i'm going i have done very very little really um uh, but the the last thing i did on music was a I gave a conference paper on one of the variations from Beethoven's Der Belli variations, which is a funny piece. It's a piece that is all about mocking us humans for how absurd we are, but mocking us lovingly. And that's one of the most extraordinary things about late Beethoven that he never achieved in his personal life because he was a disaster in his personal life. But in his work, he managed to combine tenderness with outrageous mockery of our absurd limitations. Um, and that's something that uh, he brought out in the in the, probably the very greatest piano piece he wrote. So it's a very long work. It takes over 50 minutes to um, takes over 50 minutes to get through it. But I, I completely agree with you. The, the only thing that I'm really horribly pedantic about is that when we look at scores, I don't see that as a creative process as much as a recreative oh, or course, interpretive yeah. process. So there's a, a wonderful, um, many ways very flawed, but wonderful pianist from the first half of the 20th century, Artur Schnabel. And he used to talk about all of these pieces um, by saying that they were greater than they can be played. And what he meant by that isn't so much that the piece underdetermines performance, which we know is true, you can play something correctly, but in 17 different ways, but it overdetermines performance. That you look at the score and you're saying, what am I gonna do? Because he is genuinely asking me to do seven things, four of which are incompatible. <laughs> yeah. where, 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 you know, where am I gonna go? And so back to musician, non-musician distinction, the musician is gonna walk around with her own, his own, their own solutions to these incompatible demands. And you're gonna, you know, do these two and then th that one, and then well, does that work? And then on we go. Um, whereas the lover of music will outsource that process to somebody who plays it for them. But I, I, I just wanna make the non-elitist point that you, you, I think, heard in what I said, even though I wasn't clear about it, that, um, there is such a thing as being a good musician and a bad musician, which is why somebody who is a lover of music um, can be probably in a, in a more marvelous and deep relationship with all of these things that, you know, Beethoven and Mozart left for us than somebody who is a professional musician. This man that um, I'm very slowly writing a book about, the public intellectual Isaiah Berlin, loved music probably more than he even loved the ideas, actually. But he wasn't musically trained. Um, he had so many close friends in the musical world. Um, he, he, he had a deep knowledge of certain pieces um, as memories of different renditions of them. And yeah, I'd say his relationship with music is probably deeper than so many musicians. So that's kind of how I d divide I all of that yeah. up. Yeah. It's funny, I was listening to you talk about Beethoven's m mockery, but with love. Um, mockery, but with warmth. Is that a common thread that runs through what you're interested in and also what you create? Um, love, warmth, fuzziness. Um, you are so, you find the kindest way to say almost everything. And it's clearly with much effort and intent. And I, I, I have tried to aspire to that, but I'm not as warm and fuzzy as you are good at performing and may indeed really be in real life. I am two things. I am viscerally critical of people in a way that can seem dislikable at first, but I don't very easily jump from being critical of someone to disliking them. So I'm somebody who loves humans as they are, not as they should be. And I think that makes it easier for me that when I'm presented with 
other humans who are in a very different space to where I am or where I might imagine they could be, I do not have an instinct to start pulling them over. I have an instinct of making certain things available to them and doing that in an intentional way. That's say not chucking stuff at them, but back to that digestive thing we said earlier. And then I want to see and I want to see where that goes. But I am brutal and I am even brutal on some people who watch my stuff. But I believe that even that brutality has to be part of a ritual and the process. Um, and that means that we're not just here having debates, we're not just here arguing for and against stuff. We are, um, this is a stretch of course because we're doing this online, but we are coming together into some kind of room, some kind of space, and we're kind of having a cup of tea there. And that over and over and over and over again that I find is, is, is what I find is a precondition for even beginning to put somebody in a position where they might look at something differently um, or want to even you know, question something. Um, and then, because I, I see being, being in this public intellectual business as a little bit wearing a different hat, um, for me, that hat is different because you start with the audience rather than with the ideas. You start with the audience and then the ideas come in, but they are couched according to what the audience feels, what they're scared of, what, what they're concerned about, also what you feel is, is going to be of use, of, of use to them even if they don't feel that necessarily to start with. So it's this business of putting the audience first. There's a beautiful man on um, YouTube called Brian McGee, with whom I had many arguments about this. But he was a passionate um, believer in the idea that there is no such thing as a public intellectual, because if you're a good enough intellectual, you should be able to explain the most interesting things about your ideas to the general public. And if you can't, you don't understand them well oh, enough Oh, that's foolish. That is foolish. Oh, well, so many brilliant people who are awful communicators. Th if we expected true. all brilliant people to be good communicators, we would have no smart people in important positions of power. <laughs> that's true. But what he thought that um, I have so much sympathy for, but don't entirely share, is that you can be an intellectual, and if you happen to be good at what we're doing, Whatever, yeah. um, then you can go out there and, without putting a different hat on, carry on doing the same thing. Only now you're speaking to the general public. Whereas I think you need a change, for me at least. You need to put on a different hat. And the key difference there is that the audience comes first. Um, in, in a kind of... Um, sort of awful analogy because I don't have one ready to, to, to hand um, I could say this I, I, if I'm in, I, interacting with philosophers professional philosophers and I'm sharing some ideas I'm basically offering a seven course meal and my expectation is that they will have it in the right order they will also have it with the wine pairings I propose and they'll have it sitting in the right place on my time, and after that, they can smash it, they can criticize it, but they're going to go through the process. That is completely undoable, the general public. Well, the general public is, hi, what are you feeling? We have a lot of food here. You're welcome to grab something, have it in, have it out. We're not going to compromise what we do with the food, but we're not going to sit you down, dress you up, tell you, you've got to have these seven things, go through them in this particular order. So for me, it's that difference. And so, you know, in a certain sense, it, it starts with the audience first. And I think it's something that a lot of people on this platform who have been successful actually do end up learning. Like what you are doing is utterly impossible without deep empathy for what happens to a human when they click on your video and watch the first 30 seconds or a minute. You are deeply empathetic to what their needs are, to what they might be feeling, to what their expectations might be. So that's how I see that, that difference between, if you like, the intellectual and the public intellectual world. The, 
the the people you're engaging with come first well let's put the people first and uh even though we'd like to talk probably all night uh let's go ahead and end this here i think uh you landed the ship on a on a, a dining metaphor i really appreciate that really completed my arc for me um vlad v- vlex yeah. vlad vexler is on youtube at uh, your main channel is just your name um which i imagine is probably where you'd probably recommend people start if they want to become a vlad vexler completist the next th- place to go is probably the vlad vexler chat channel which i think if you enjoyed this conversation this is that's where you get to see vlad be who you have heard him be for the last hour and it's where i spend most of my time with your content is on the chat channel um and i loved spending this time with you now vlad thank you you're the best all right i'm gonna do my thing where i i say uh, to the audience i say um hey make good choices talk to you next time